Yeah, all right. Well, let's, um, let's pray and we'll ask the Lord to, uh, to guide us uh, in terms of what we're looking at today. Dear Father, thank you for how we can meet. And we thank you for how these challenging times make us really appreciate fellowship. Even with masks on, it's just so nice to greet each other and be able to sing songs of the faith together. And we thank you for even how we could break bread, just to remove our mask for a little while and, and to eat that bread and drink the cup and remember the incredible cost it was for you to save our soul. And we thank you for this book we're going through, the book of Revelation. And we come to some challenging uh, chapters but we thank you that it's there for a purpose. It's your word. It's your revelation to us. And we ask as we continue to go through the book of Revelation that we will make sure that we first of all see Jesus in every page and that we would also see, Lord, what is destined to come and that we might understand uh, what we should be doing here on earth right now before these things come. So we ask that you'd help us and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Well, some of you know this story, but I'm going to share it if you haven't heard it. In uh, March 2010, uh, Colin and I uh, were celebrating our wedding anniversary over at Rottnest Island. And it was a beautiful day. We went snorkelling, beautiful morning, had a nice lunch and everything was going good. Um, and then I noticed that there were some storm clouds gathering to the north of the island. And I said to Colleen, we've had a lovely morning, why don't we go back early? Because we were going to go back about five, six o'clock at night. Why don't we go back early um, to Frio? So we decided we'd do that. And so we were put on the first available ferry, which really wasn't a ferry, it's a 30-seater open boat. It's an ex SAS assault um, craft and with massive engines. It's called the Wave Jumper. So we got put on this one. And uh, the storm is really developing, you can see that. And the way the boat was faced, the, the um, captain of the boat, he was, um, his back was to the storm developing and he's going on about safety. And I'm thinking, man, we've got to get going. And um, anyway, he's talking away and finally he, he turned around to see what was going on because he must have seen all our eyes on the storm and he sees what's going on and he quickly races to the um, control and, um, and takes off really fast. So off we go. And I don't know, in the next 30 minutes, I've got to tell you, it was m the most incredible experience, both scary and exhilarating. Forgetting about jumping waves, that was just nothing. It was like we were um, surfing the storm front. So behind the, behind the storm front is just absolutely jet black. And in the storm front right above us, like surfing it, we have this turbulent grey, dark grey cloud that is throwing lightning bolts out everywhere and we're in a metal craft as well, so I don't know how we never got hit. And, um, and this is how it was for 30 minutes until we got to Frio, and once we hit Frio, slowed down, the storm went over us, and we got pelted by hail. <laughs> it was the 22nd of March, 2010. Do you remember that date? The great hailstorm of Perth. And we happened to be at Rotto. <laughs> what were we thinking? <laughs> And anyway, I share that story because it was uh, pretty insane, that storm. It was a massive storm. It was the biggest storm ever recorded in Perth. One billion dollars damage, they estimate. It was devastating. And uh, the hail fell. It was, some of the hail fell in some areas that was very uh, thick and, and heavy, uh, like golf balls, tennis balls. And it did a lot, a lot of damage. But you know, as I think about that storm, I want to say to you from our reading this morning, there is a storm coming far, far greater than anything that we've ever experienced. And Revelation chapter 8 and chapter 9 is about a massive storm that is coming upon this earth. What did you think of what we read? It's pretty in incredible, isn't it? Well, we're going to look at Revelation 8 and 9. I know we never read 9. And we're going to have a look and see uh, when these events will happen, um, what will happen, and why they will happen. So let's begin. And I want to begin not by reading Revelation 8, but I want you to understand where we are at the moment in the book of Revelation. So what time period is Revelation 8 and 9? And I think we can work it out. In Revelation chapter 6, at the end of chapter 6, we read there's a great marker, remember the word I'm using, marker, a great marker in the book of Revelation that very clearly, end of Revelation 6 is about what? It's about the return of Christ. Got all that language about the, 
the sun being darkened and the, and the sky rolling up like a scroll and, and you've got this language that's about the return of Christ. And then Revelation 7, which we looked at last week, what a chapter, you can so, see so clearly this is speaking about the ones who, who were right with Jesus when he came and, and they were right with Jesus when they died and they are where? They are before the throne. They're in glory. I've got to read to you some of those great words that we read. So Revelation 7, 9 and 10 say these words. After these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands and they cry out with a loud voice saying salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Wow, what a picture. A picture of just wonder and joy for those who are the saved, for those who received Jesus, who received Jesus before they died and those who received Jesus uh, before Jesus came back. That's where they'll be. And then we come to Revelation 8. Revelation 8 and Revelation 9 are about what happens to those who were left behind. That's really important. Revelation 8 and 9 is about the great storm from heaven that comes upon those who were left behind. Why were they left behind? We have to be so clear here. It wasn't because, of, because they were not religious enough. It wasn't because they weren't good enough. It was to do with because they rejected Jesus. They did not repent of their sins and receive the Lord Jesus into their hearts to save them. And they are left behind. And when Jesus returns, he does those two big things. He will receive to himself all those who have put their faith in him. Hallelujah. But he will also come and bring the judgment of God upon those who remain. This is the word of the Lord. We cannot minimise this. This is what God says. And I want to show you in Revelation 6, even the people left behind, they have a sense of this. It's like in our hearts, we know. We know deep down what the truth is, but we keep pushing Jesus away. Remember Revelation 6, two weeks ago, verses 16 and 17? It says, And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Hear those words? They have a sense, don't they? Even before anything happens, that they are in trouble. And they're in trouble from God because of how they did not receive Jesus. When I consider Revelation 6, 16 and 17, and very shortly as we look at Revelation chapter 8, it's important for us to ask this question especially in the way things are at the moment in Christendom. What view do you have of God? The dominant view seems to me at the present time is that God is just a God of love. He's a gracious God. And somehow, you know, a very dominant view is that we all go to heaven or if you don't get to heaven, you just get annihilated, nothing happens, there's no, nothing happens, you know, you know it's all, all okay. That, that's a real dominant view in our Bible colleges and in many um, Christian circles these days. Do you not understand that? But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches us that our God, absolutely perfect, is both loving and righteous. Amen to his glorious character. This is our God. He is absolutely loving. Ab surely, surely he is. Like you think of what God has done to save us. He saved us at great cost to himself. He allowed his own son to take the fall for us, to be punished for us. But in his great love, do you notice even God's righteousness being there? He didn't just say, I forgive you. He couldn't. He's a righteous God. The only way he could forgive us was to deal with our sins justly. Someone had to pay the penalty. The, the incredible news, it was God's son himself who paid the penalty so that God can justly forgive us for the wrong things we've done. There's a righteousness of God. But also in Revelation 8 and 9, before we even read one word, ver, look at one verse in the sermon, I want you to understand everything we see in Revelation 8 and 9 is also according to the righteousness of God. God is a righteous God. And that's what we see. 
we see God's righteous anger. And what a thing it is to see. So we're going to be um, looking at this. I'm going to just read a verse later on in Revelation 19. It says in verse 1 and 2, end of verse 1, beginning of verse 2, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and righteous. That's a pretty big theme in Revelation. No matter what we read, as Christians, we need to remember God is being fair and just. God is being righteous. He's a God of great slowness to anger, a God of incredible patience. But there is a time coming when God will unleash his wrath through his son. Even think of Jesus. Oh, Jesus, meek and mild Jesus. No, Jesus, the great king, will execute the father's wrath upon those who are left behind, upon those who shunned his love, upon those who rejected the Saviour, upon those who rebelled in their hearts against the rule of God. And, you know, friends, as I say all these things, surely you must be aware of the things rapidly happening in our world where we have a world that is anti-God, a God who, who so loves the world, but people want to break every chain and every fetter, that's what they call it, of God, to be free to do what they want. And it's coming, the storm is coming when God will execute his righteous judgment. But right now we live in a day of grace. Oh, praise his name. This is the time for us to get right with God. All right, so that's, um, they're all pretty important things. And I'm so glad too, I read this verse either last week or the week before, but I'm so glad we're not here. Revelation 6 is about when we are here. The troubles of this world, war and violence and all sorts of things happening, the martyrdom, a persecution of Christians. Revelation 8 and 9, we're not here. We've been taken up to be with the Lord. Praise his name. Remember that verse in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9? It says, For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. I view it like this. Revelation 6, which we looked at a few weeks ago, is the wrath of Satan against Christians. Revelation 8 and 9 is the wrath of a just God against those who refused to believe in his son Jesus. It helps us understand where we are. Okay, so let's have a look now um, at Revelation chapter 8. And I'm going to just read the first verse to begin with. And don't forget there's a question box in the passageway if you've got questions on Revelation. I, can't, I won't be able to answer them all, I'm sure about that. But I, I can always uh, do my best. So don't, but feel free to, to put any questions in the, um, in the box out there in the hall or in the passageway. Okay, Revelation chapter 8, verse 1, says these great words. When the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I want to just pause and look at this verse. Uh, the Lamb, that's the Lord Jesus, our Saviour. God's lamb, the one sacrificed for us. And I want you to pick up, he's always calling the shots. Our Lord Jesus has the authority. He's the king. And he's the one breaking the seals. He's the one, and the seals being broken mean he's the one who is calling uh, the next shot. What's going to happen to the earth? He's in control. Okay, so that's very important. And he break, breaks the seventh seal. Remember the seventh seal? There was a scroll with seven seals. This is the last seal that's broken. And now the scroll can be opened after the events of the seventh seal. This is the uh, scroll that Jesus went up to the throne of his father and took from the right hand of him who sits on the throne. Remember we looked at that? What an emo most momentous event when Jesus, the only one, the only one worthy to take the scroll from the hand of him who sits on the throne. Only Jesus has been entrusted with this scroll which contains what is to come in regard to the final state of the saved and the new age that will come in with Christ ruling and reigning. What a scroll. Can't be opened yet. There was a seventh seal, but it's broken. And so that happens. And there's a silence in heaven. A silence in heaven for about half an hour. I just want to say, in my view, this silence is because something really, really big is going to happen. And it's like there's a holy hush in heaven. And it's even big for God. It's even big for God. Because God is going to do something 
that it's even hard for God, in this, if I can say it like that. Why do I say that? God does not delight in destroying the wicked. Do you know that? But he's a righteous God. There's a great verse in Ezekiel 18, verse 23. Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, rather that they should turn from their ways and live. Do you hear that verse? That's the heart of God. Let me read it to you again. Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, rather that they should turn from their ways and live. But God is a righteous God. And after many centuries of grace, there comes a time when God will act and there's silence in heaven before it happens. It's a big thing. God is going to strike people that he has made in his image. He's going to strike people who his son died for, but they refuse to believe in him. Okay, so let's now read verses, um, the next few verses, verses 2 to 4. And it says here, And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel came and stood at the altar, holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him, so that he might add to it the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. What's that about? Before those trumpets are blown and huge cataclysmic events occur on the earth at God's command, at Christ's command, we have some interesting information. I can't help as I read that think about two things. This is going to happen, these big events, this wrath of God coming upon the earth because of two reasons. The two reasons are this, God's a righteous God. He must deal with it. A second reason is this, God has heard the prayers of his saints, his children. What prayers have we made to God? Many times we are praying for people to be saved. We're asking for God to save people so that they might invite Jesus into their life. But there's another prayer many Christians pray too, especially in persecuted countries. Lord, when will you take vengeance? for what is happening to us. We, we found that in Revelation chapter 6. Remember chapter 6 verse 10? It speaks about the martyrs. In Revelation 6 verse 10 we read, And the martyrs cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Well, there's a, there's a place for us to pray that. Even Jesus in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 23, we read these words, while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. We want people to be saved, but we also know there's a place for God to deal with what people have done to his children. And so God will smell the incense, the prayers of the saints, and with his righteous heart, he will bring judgment upon all those who have suffered for Christ, all those who have been persecuted, all of us who have struggled to be a Christian in this hostile world against the Christian faith. What a God. He's our Father. He knows what we go through. There's a day coming when he will stand up for us and bring vengeance. That's why we don't do it now. We're not to do it now. We are to allow God to do that on our behalf. And so then judgment will come. And let's now read about these things. Reading verse 5, Revelation 8, verse 5. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and threw it to the earth, and there followed peals of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. Can you just imagine that? Just that one verse. This is what God's doing. From heaven comes um, thunder and lightning like never seen before across the whole world. And there is like this, this earthquake. The whole earth is trembling. It's all quaking. And people who did not receive Jesus are there left behind. And you can imagine how many there's going to be. Like there's going to be, what's our population? Near 8 billion. There's a lot of people. Only a few of us are Christians. And there we go, there it's, there's, that's how it's going to be. And then we read in verses um, uh, 6, uh, we read these words. 
Uh, I'll read on uh, 6 to 12 actually. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound them. And the first sounded and there came hail and fire mixed with blood and they were thrown to the earth and a third of the earth was burnt up and a third of the trees were burnt up and all the green grass was burnt up. Now we are to take these words literally as much as we can but of course there's metaphoric language here too. But what you should be picking up here is that there are huge, huge events coming. Where are they coming from? From heaven. That's how you know it's the wrath of God. These are not natural disasters. We're talking about God doing spectacular things like we have in the Bible when it came to God acting in Egypt to deliver his people from Israel. It's going to be bigger than that though. But remember, everything we read here, this is the, the, the righteous and just anger of God towards people who have refused to bow their knee to Jesus. They have spurned the love of God. Uh, verse 8. The second angel sounded and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood and a third of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died and a third of the ships were destroyed. You know, I look at some of this language, a great mountain, I wonder if that's an asteroid. This is just me surmising. And if it is, I'm amazed that God has an asteroid already marked for the right time, right place, bang. What a God. He can do that. When I read the next one, think about what might God might have in place. A comet. I reckon it might be a comet. Perfectly poised at the right time. According to God's decree, already there, but coming at the right time onto our earth to bring cataclysmic events. What do I say, comment? Well, listen to verse 10. The third angel sounded and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. That's what a comet looks like. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And a third of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died from the waters because they were made bitter. Wow. This is not natural disasters, is it? We're not meant to conclude here this is just like what we've already seen before. These are huge events coming from God, from Jesus, uh, onto our earth. And then verse 12 says, The fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun and a third of the moon and a third of the stars were struck, that a third of them would be darkened, and the day would not shine for a third of it, and the night in the same way. Let me make a few comments. Isn't it interesting that the word or the phrase a third, this fraction a third is mentioned? It's interesting that God is not choosing to do a complete desolation. It's a third, a third of the land, a third of the oceans, a third of the rivers, a third of the sunlight. Many are dying, but many are still surviving. Many are living. It's going to be a horrible time. But it's a time where God is executing his righteous judgment. Even I have to ask myself, do I, do I love and appreciate the full character of God? Do I appreciate both his love and his righteousness? That's what we need to be. If we're Christians, Jesus has opened our hearts to the, the true God and who he is and we're meant to love his whole being. He is perfect in all his ways. But then we read in Revelation 8 verse 13 these words. Then I looked and I heard an eagle flying in mid heaven saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. So that's saying to us that even all that had gone beforehand was um, small compared to what was going to happen. And, and everyone on the earth is warned, woe, 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 in regards to what is to come. Again, I want you to make sure you understand the Lord Jesus, he is calling all these things to come into being. He's the one who is executing the wrath of his Father. The one who died on the cross for us will also be the one who brings judgment upon those who did not bow their knee to him. So let's have a read now into Revelation 9 and see uh, two of the woes that are mentioned. I'm going to read verses uh, 1 to 6 of Revelation 9. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth, and the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. 
He opened the bottomless pit, and smoke went up out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and power was given them, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were told not to hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Seal of God, they were the ones mentioned in Revelation 7. They're, we believe they were Jewish believers, a great group of them who are sealed with the seal of God who are on the earth, protected from all that's happening. And then we read verse 5, And they were not permitted to kill anyone, that's these locusts, but to torment for five months. And the torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. And in those days men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die and death will flee from them. Wow. This woe, like the fifth trumpet being blown, is one of, what, how do you describe it? Of incredible torment and suffering. And people are trying to die, but they can't. God is keeping them alive to suffer. Suffer? Why? Suffer? suffer under the righteous anger of God. Because of what you did to my son. Because of what you've done to my people. Because of how you did not open your heart to me. What a time. Verses 7 to, uh, to 11, we won't read that, gives more information about what this is about. Okay, now let's read verse 12 onwards. The first woe is past. Behold, two woes are still coming after these things. Verse 13. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar which is before God. One saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day and months and year were released so that they would kill a third of mankind. Even when I read that, I think, wow, God has got his, this calendar in heaven. Everything is marked. Nothing moves. They're there, ready for the day. Wow. And it says there, um, the, and the, back to verse 15, And the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day and months and year were released so that they would kill, wow, a third of mankind. If we have... Seven billion people will probably be less than that by that stage, but, you know, I don't know, a lot of people are going to die. The number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. And this is how I saw in the vision the horses and those who sat on them. The riders had breastplates, the colour of fire and of hyacinths and of brimstone. And the heads of the horses are like the heads of lions and out of their mouths proceed fire and smoke and brimstone. A third of mankind was killed by these three plagues, by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which proceeded out of their mouths. For the power of the horse is in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents and have heads, and with them they do harm. What picture language? I don't know what to make of all that, but all I know, this is going to be a, a time of great distress. All because our God, there comes a time when he must act justly. So friends, in these chapters, behold God's righteousness. How do you feel about God's righteous anger? You know, when I think about these things, I can't help but think of how amazing our salvation is. I should be left on the earth. I should be suffering all this. I am a sinner. I have rebelled against God's righteous rule. Even as a Christian, I have sinned against my God. But I'm saved, washed in the blood. Forgiven of all my sins. I'll be standing in another place, not on the earth, but on the, in the throne before my God. All because of Jesus. All because of what he's done for you and I. Praise his name. Wow, what a salvation we have. We, when we talk about being saved, we often just, just are so narrow in our focus of what it is. God has willingly and gladly saved us. And we will not incur his righteous judgment. But that's what we deserve. All these. But that's only the second woe I read. What's the third woe? The third woe we won't read about in detail till we get to Revelation 20. What is the third woe? The third woe is when everyone will stand before the great white throne. The third woe is most, most important to understand. The third woe 
is when every unrepentant sinner will hear from God those words depart from me and they will be sentenced to eternal punishment in the lake of fire. That is the third woe. All these things are nothing compared to that one. That's eternity. Eternal punishment, eternal torment. That's what Jesus has come to save us from and to save us into his kingdom, to be with him around the throne. Now I want to finish by just reading now verses 20 and 21. And these words really hit me hard. Revelation 9, 20 and 21. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not... What does it say? Can you believe what it says? Did not repent of the works of their hands so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stone and of wood which can neither see nor hear nor walk. They did not repent of their murders nor of their sorceries nor of their immorality nor of their thefts. And I look at that and I go, I'm sort of shocked. Can human beings be like this? Can we be so rebellious? Can we put a fist up to God and not bow the knee? How can this be? Doesn't it show what our, us, we're like? And I look at my own life. If it were not for the work of the Spirit of Christ in me, I'd be just like that. So bent on doing our own thing. So bent on holding on to our idols. So bent on doing whatever pleases me and to remove God from my life. I praise the name of the Lord the day when he found me and saved me and changed my heart. What a God. What a picture of humans. You would have thought that they would bow their knee to Jesus. You would have thought that they would let, it, let go of all their idols and given their life to Christ, but they do not and they will not. They will not let go of their sins. They will not let go of their rule of their life. They will not let go. They refuse. In fact, I even wonder if these people who survive think, wow, we're the heroes. We have survived the plagues. Here we are. We're still standing. Let's throw the fist up to God. Not aware of the third woe. Standing before the great white throne and God throwing them into hell. What a picture of humans. How fallen we are. How fallen. But in this day of grace, praise the Lord that we have the Holy Spirit working in our life, softening our hearts, opening our minds to the truth of our God and his love for us and our need for Jesus. Why is Revelation 8 and 9 in Revelation? It's a difficult passage to speak from. I believe it's because God wants us to know some pretty important things, two big things. I'm a righteous God. I think of those words in Revelation 15 verse 4. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and give glory to your name. Your name is holy. You know, when I think of who God is, God wants us to see who he is. His judgments are righteous and judged, just. We ought to fear the Lord. But the other thing that I can't help but think of is these words in Revelation 9, 20 and 21 make me realise right now it's so important we understand what's coming and right now we do everything we can to get right with God. And what is that? Repent. Repent of our sins and receive Jesus as our Lord and Saviour because this day is coming. And as soon as you die, your fate's already sealed. You'll stand before the great white throne. Or if you're here, when Jesus returns and you haven't given your life to Christ, you will face the wrath of God. And so this is a really important lesson here in these chapters that we learn and we humble ourselves right now and fear the Lord and we repent of our sins and we give our life to Christ. Amen and amen. That's what we've got to do. That's why God's written this in his book, that we might do this. And the voice that is being sounded out in Christendom is God's only a loving God. And the voice of the world is there is no God. Let's forget about him. But the real God speaks, repent. I call on you to repent, to receive Jesus, that you might be saved. What a gracious God. And if you are saved, and I know many of you are, I can't help but even look at this passage with difficult things in it, I can't help but rejoice. I can't help but go, hallelujah. Oh Lord, thank you so much for saving me, saving you 
from what we really deserve. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for allowing Jesus to be judged in my place so that I might not be judged. Praise his name. Well, if any of you are are not right with the Lord and you're sensing you need to, uh, I really would encourage you to see Rod or myself after the service. And if you're online, then please give us a ring. We're now going to sing a, a song, a beautiful song. I haven't sung it for a long time. I've wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming home. The path of sin too long I've trod. Lord, I'm coming home. And I trust there will be people who may respond to this and come home to Jesus. appreciate a song like that and I love the emphasis on repentance a word that's just left out so often now 
There's two things we are to do. Jesus has done it all. What are those two things? Repent. Repent of your sins and receive Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. And how we need to make sure we preach that to repent. It's not a matter of just keep doing what you've been doing and God's going to forgive you because you have Jesus. We need to repent and receive Jesus. Do you love the uh, word home? Uh, there's only one true home. That's being in Jesus. And what a home. I've got to read these words to you before I finish. This is our home. It says in Revelation 7 that we looked at last week uh, that we will be before the throne. They, they, those who wash themselves in the blood of Christ, they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple and he who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. What a home. They will hunger no longer nor thirst any more nor will the sun beat down on them nor any heat. And the lamb in the centre of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to the springs of the water of life and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. That's home. What a contrast to what we read in Revelation 8 and 9. Oh, may we all love Jesus and trust in him. I don't know if some of you need to recommit your life. You know, sometimes we wonder, are we saved? You know, you need to bow yourself before Christ and call on him to save you. Make sure you're saved. Let me pray. Dear Father, we thank you for all your word, including Revelation 8 and 9. We're sorry that we so often disrespect your character and we play down the things that we read in Revelation 8 and 9. We're sorry for that. You're perfect, you are righteous, and we're glad you're righteous. And thank you, though, that you're also gracious. Thank you for this very, very special time in Earth's history where you have allowed this day to be a day of grace, where any of us, no matter where we've been or whatever we've done, we can be actually forgiven of all our sins through faith in Jesus. Thank you for this very special time. It would help us to, to truly repent and trust in Jesus. You know my heart. You know the hearts of each one here. May we be truly saved. And as a result, may we go home to glory if we die or we get taken up to be with Jesus if he should return. And Lord, please give us a real heart for those who are lost. Help us to remember what's coming. Help us to lovingly warn and care for people and to faithfully point them to your Son. Help us to bear their, um, their, you know, Lord, all their horribleness to us, how they might persecute us, how they might put us down. Help us to bear all that because we understand what they're going to face one day. Help us to love them. Lord, we've got family and friends and neighbours who are lost. Please would you give us a heart of compassion for them. Help us to tell them about Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that we can meet today. Thank you for the timing of things. We have lived in a period when we've had the pestilence of COVID, we've had fire, we've got flooding up north. And in the midst of it all, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that it's he who matters most. Thank you for him. And Lord, we ask these things in your son's name. Amen.